Uh, hi, so I'm Eugene. I'm going to talk about the uh, sequence models and the recurrent neural network API in TensorFlow. First, the motivating example. Uh, Google Translate this is an awesome product. Uh, a lot of people really love it. And uh, how does it work? You type in or you speak in um, a sentence in a source language. Um, some magic happens in the background, and you get uh, the translation in a target language. And as of a couple of months ago, um, the magic got a little bit more magical. Um, the, and that's because the, um, the product is now backed by a uh, neural network, and specifically a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. So what is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model? Basically, it's uh, two uh, recurrent neural networks. One on the left is the encoder. And the encoder um, reads in uh, one word or word piece at a time. Um, from left to right, then it creates some, and it creates some intermediate representation. Then the decoder, which is a second uh, recurrent neural network, or RNN, um, it receives a start token that says um, start decoding in this target language, and uh, it emits one word or word piece at a time uh, in the target language. And uh, once it emits a token, it feeds that back into the next time step, and that token and the previous state are used to figure out what to emit next. Now, in practice, the model is a little bit more complicated. Um, you've seen this slide a couple of times today. And uh, let me um, just focus on the fact that, again, here, there's an encoder, RNN on the left. There's some intermediate representation in the middle. And on the right, we have a decoder, RNN. And we're going to refer back to this slide a couple of times. But let's talk about what we're going to talk about. First of all, we'll talk about how to read and batch sequence data efficiently in a distributed setting for training. We'll talk about the RNN API itself. And as we talk about that, um, we're going to start talking about fully dynamic calculation in TensorFlow. And I'll give you some tools for, um, that allow you to do that. Uh, then we'll switch tracks a little bit and talk about how to trade off flexibility for efficiency um, in, in the RNN. And finally, we'll talk about a neat new library that uh, we're working on that allows you to perform dynamic decoding. All right, so reading and batching sequence data. Um, so as, you, uh, try, as we scale up our training for, let's say, the translation model, it's very important to be able to feed in large mini batches of variable length data. And uh, so here we're going to be focusing on um, the source sentence, which is on the lower left, and on the target sentence, which is on the lower right and on the, on the upper right. And we're going to focus on how to do this efficiently in a distributed setting. So um, for this, we have a proto a called the sequence example. And uh, Google protobufs are, um, as you've heard, a language agnostic, architecture agnostic data storage format. And the sequence example format is made specifically to store variable length sequences. So, some of the pros, it provides efficient storage of multiple sequences per example. It uh, supports a variable number of features per time step, uh, which we won't talk about, um, but is an important feature. Uh, and also, we provide an efficient parser that reads in a serialized proto string and emits uh, tensors or, and or sparse tensors according to the configuration that you provide. And coming soon, well, you heard Noah talk about TensorFlow serving. Um, the sequence example proto is going to have, be a first class citizen in TensorFlow serving. So you'll be able to use it um, for uh, creating data both at training time and um, at serving time with TensorFlow serving. OK, so now that you can read in a sequence one at a time, you need to be able to batch it. Um, and there are a couple of ways to do this. So one way is you basically do um, the padding yourself. So you, um, you pick a maximum sequence length, and each of your inputs, you pad to that maximum sequence length, and then you <laughs> pass it into the standard TensorFlow batching mechanism, the function tf.train.batch. So the major um, negatives of this approach, one, you need to know beforehand the longest possible sequence length, and then you'll always pad to that, pad to that maximum length. And as a result, you're wasting both space and time um, during training. So can we do better? Um, so the next best thing is to allow 
the batching mechanism to perform the padding for you. So you get your variable length sequences one at a time, and you feed them into um, this special padding queue. And the queue, when it reads off a mini batch, it finds the longest sequence, and it pads all of the other sequences up to that maxim maximum length. So this is a little bit better. You don't need to know the maximum length. Um, when you get a mini batch, you're no longer wasting space or time um, because you're only padding up to the maximum length of the net batch. However, as you're trying to scale up training, for example, and your batch sizes become larger and larger, 64, 32, uh, 32, 64, 128, uh, you're more and more likely that at least one of the elements in every mini batch is going to be long. And so as a result, you're back to where you started in the previous slide, um, wasting space and computation time. But we can do better. So um, the, the solution here is to actually create a number of different queues, uh, which we call buckets, um, running at the same time. And when you, um, you pass into this mechanism uh, variable length sequence, it will put it into one of a number of queues. And each queue um, will contain only sequences that are about the same length. Uh, and when a mini batch is available from that queue, um, it will be that mini batch is returned to you as the next mini batch. And all of the sequences within that mini batch are about the same length. Um, there's a little bit of padding, but this still gives you the best of, of both worlds because um, every mini batch, everything's about the same length. You're not padding too much, you're not wasting too much spot, um, computation time or space during training. Um, and everyone's, and most of the time, you get your short or medium length sequences. Um, as they come in, almost as, as quickly as they come in. Every once in a while, um, you'll get a mini batch from your spillover from the very long sequences. Um, but again, here, even though it takes longer to compute and uses more memory, at least um, all of the sequences within this mini batch are all pretty long, so you're not wasting time. OK, and we have a function for that. It's called uh, bucket by sequence length. Finally, uh, for those of you who are not necessarily interested in sequence to sequence models, uh, but are interested in building language models or uh, variational autoencoders, for example, uh, you can, uh, we have a state saver, which allows you to implement something called truncated backpropagation through time. So what this means is that you pick a fixed number of time steps that you'll unroll for, and any sequence which is longer that, than that number of time steps gets split up into multiple segments. When you um, finish your mini batch, any sequences uh, or segments which are not the completed sequence, the state is saved for you. Some bookkeeping is done in the background. And at the next um, uh, training iteration, um, that state is loaded. Um, and is then um, you continue um, processing that, that sequence um, with, that, with that saved state. And we have a function for that. It's called batch sequences with states. All right. So um, now we've, that we've talked a little bit about how to efficiently read in variable length data and batch it, let's talk about RNNs. All right. So just to get everybody on the same page, what is an RNN? Uh, an RNN is basically um, a unit of computation that you repeat over and over. It's essentially a for loop. And um, the way that the uh, forward calculation flows, uh, you get um, inputs from below, so x at every time step, and you have some inputs which are the, the state from the previous time step. Um, so these are the arrows from the left. And this intermediate calculation uh, emits a new output, h, and an updated state for the next time step. Right? So this diagram specifically is an implementation of an LSTM, or long short-term memory, which is a very popular RNN architecture. So as I said, you can think of it as a for loop. And in fact, you can implement it, um, say in Python, um, as a for loop. So let's, let's go through this um, relatively straightforward approach. So you have a function RNN. It accepts a function cell that reads in inputs in state and emits new outputs in state. Um, you also provide it with a list of input tensors. And you provide it with a, some initial state. So you set your state to the initial state. You loop over your list of input tensors. So these are, are dense floating point tensors. And at each iteration, you call cell. You emit an output. 
um, and a new state, you append this output to your list of output tensors. And at the very end, you return this list and the final state. Um, so as uh, I showed you on the previous slide, uh, you have, um, for an LSTM, for example, the state is actually two tensors, not just one. For a GRU, which is another popular architecture, uh, there's only one tensor for this state. And so the, the simpler problem, or one of the problems, is that the, the self function and the initial state are coupled. So you need to provide an initial state. This is um, one or a couple of tensors, which usually have all zero values. And um, if you want to change your architecture and try another one, so you change your cell, you need to be able to easily uh, generate, for example, an, a new initial state with a different structure. Um, so that problem is actually fairly easy to solve by changing the functions to objects. And I'll talk about that next. The harder problem is that here you have a list of, of input tensors. And this is a fixed size list. You're in Python, after all. And you're building a graph that has a fixed number of time steps. And so as a result, you're basically losing the ability to run a variable number of iterations. We'll talk about that next. So first, the RNN cell. So the RNN cell is a base class um, that we provide, which, uh, use, which a different architecture subclass, and it provides um, helper properties that give you knowledge about that architecture. Now, the second um, important feature of the RNN cell uh, class library is that uh, you can treat each time step as um, building a time step as building a layer. And so you heard Francois talk about Keras. And uh, for the last month or so, in the background, we've been working to um, make RNN cells um, act like Keras layers. Um, and so eventually, we hope to have full compatibility between the two. But let's, let's go through an example. Suppose you want to implement um, an LSTM. First, you build an, a basic LSTM class. It's a subclass of RNN cell. Um, it has two important properties. The first one is state size. And what this state size tells you is that my state is composed of two tensors, and each tensor has num units columns. So these are the, the depth of the LSTM. The second property, output size, tells you I have, I emit at every time step a single tensor, and it has num units columns. Finally, there's a call method um, that accepts an input tensor and a state tuple in this case. It decomposes the state into two tensors performs the intermediate calculations for the time step, uh, and emits a new output, new h, and the new state tuple. OK. So um, this is a fairly flexible framework. Uh, framework and um, we have a fairly uh, sizable library of different implementations of different um, architectures, including uh, basic RNN cells, LSTM, GRU, uh, a bunch of other um, interesting research um, oriented um, architectures. Uh, one that's uh, particularly interesting is the, the bottom one, um, NAS cell. So if you heard um, um, Megan uh, talk this morning about uh, neural architecture search, one of the fruits um, of this research program is this new architecture that was basically learned by a, a reinforcement learning on, pos on different possible um, RNN architectures. Um, and so we have an implementation of that as of this week on TensorFlow GitHub. It's called NAS Cell. So check it out and see if it uh, provides you with a performance uh, a quality boost. And within Google, we have um, dozens of slightly different or radically different RNN architectures that are used by <coughs> different teams to solve their problem. OK, so we've talked about solving the, the simple problem. Um, Let's talk about how to perform dynamic calculation in TensorFlow. And uh, there are basically two tools that I like to talk about. And these are the main primitives um, that are used to build dynamic calculations. Uh, the first one is the TFY loop. And it allows you to build dynamic loops uh, and supports backprop. The second one is called TensorArray. And this is required to be able to efficiently um, read and write slices of tensors and also supports backprop. OK, so the while loop was developed by Yuan, who is a, a research scientist on the brain team. 
And it's a function that basically accepts three arguments. The cond, lambda, the body lambda, and loop vars. So the cond is the, um, the condition function that tells you, should I continue this loop or not? The body implements the actual computation per time step. And the loop vars are the initial conditions um, being fed to the while loop. So let's go through an example. We'll start with a tuple of tuples, ijk naught. Um, the values it takes on are 0, 1, and 2. The condition lambda looks at the first component i and says, continue looping while i is less than 10. Uh, the body uh, takes uh, both of these parameters, uh, variables, i and jk, increments i by 1, and updates uh, jk with the calculation that you see there. You pass these into the while loop, and at the output, you receive a tuple of tuples of tensors. So the final value of i, which um, if you look at this, basically is going to be equal to 10. And jk fi final, which is a tuple of tensors, which contains uh, the result of performing the calculation there 10 times. OK, so while loop gets you almost all the way there. But um, if you need to be able to process slices of tensors uh, at every time step, you need to be able to efficiently um, um, access them and to write new ones. So for this, we have a tensor array. So let's suppose that you have a matrix, and you don't know at graph build time how many rows that matrix has. But you can use the TensorFlow primitive TF shape uh, to access that um, at runtime. So let's say this, this is equivalent to an unknown um, sequence length right, in your, in your mini batch. So uh, first, you create a tensor array um, whose uh, number of entries, its size, is equal to matrix rows. And then you can unpack or unstack the matrix into that tensor array. Then inside the while loop body, you can access um, any index um, that you want, and you'll get back out a vector. You perform some processing, and then you need to take the result and store that in the new matrix. So the way you do that is first you create a tensor array. Again, in this case, you know the size that it's going to be, but in fact, you don't even need to know the size beforehand. Then within the loop, you write and update that tensor array um, at whatever uh, row you want. And the result of your calculation is that vector. You pass it in there. You take that tensor array, you update it. At the very end of the while loop, you get the finally updated tensor array. And then you can stack it, pack it, and you get a new matrix. Okay? And that's the result of your, of your calculation. Between these two primitives, you can get pretty far. In fact, we have a whole library of functional building blocks in TensorFlow that you can use based on these. So we have a map function. We have TensorFlow scan, which is somewhat similar to Theano scan, uh, in some ways more powerful. We have the left fold and right fold operators. We have the dynamic RNN function, which I'll talk about next. We have a couple of other um, variants of RNN. Um, and also, we have a dynamic decoder function, which I'll also talk about towards the end of this talk. Finally, there, there are a bunch of other interesting algorithms that you can implement um, using these primitives. All right, so let's talk about the encoder of the translation model. So a couple of interesting things to, to that uh, we can see in this encoder. First of all, it has eight stacked LSTM layers. And each one sits on a different GPU device. And between each of the layers, there are residual connections. So residual connections are actually very important in being able to train um, a performant model that has such a large stack of layers. So we'd like to implement this uh, using the API I presented to you. Turns out it's two lines of code, um, fairly gnarly code, but let me, let, let me step you through them. So first of all, you build your LSTM cells. Each one has, say, a depth of 512. You then um, would like to add residual connections, so you wrap each of these objects in a residual wrapper. You'd like to put each of these um, layers on a different GPU, so you wrap that in a device wrapper. Uh, and each one goes on GPU 0, GPU 1, and so on. So you make a list of these, and then you wrap that in a multi-RNN cell. Okay, so you take this object, and you pass it to the dynamic RNN function. It takes the cell. It takes a tensor of uh, many batches of inputs. It takes uh, a vector with the sequence lengths. 
um, of each of the mini batch entries, and a couple of other arguments that control the trade off between memory consumption and um, performance. Okay, so what I've presented to you so far is um, a fairly flexible API for customizing and implementing your own RNN architectures and dynamic decoding. Um, and uh, sometimes you know that you want to use an LSTM or you want to use a GRU, you want to use an established RNN architecture. So in these cases, um, you have the option uh, to trade off um, flexibility for performance. And in TensorFlow, there are basically, we provide three ways to do that. Uh, the first one, um, Chris and Todd talked about earlier today, uh, is XLA. Um, I'll talk about that one first. Um, there are also uh, handwritten C++ kernels um, that um, provide manually fused implementations of, say, LSTM per time step. And there are also um, man manually designed, um, fully fused RNM implementations that fuse the entire calculation across time. Um, so as you look at these, think about the kinds of trade-offs that uh, you're making. So you're trading off flexibility for speed. Uh, some of these implementations don't work well on some architectures, uh, and are, but are faster on others. And now I'll, I'll mention these. So let's first talk about XLA. Um, the nice thing about XLA is that there's very minimal uh, flexibility trade-off. You um, implement an RNN cell, and you get um, an architecture that you care about, and then it's basically one step to get it compiled. So if before you had a stack of eight LSTM cells, um, and you want to fuse each of them individually um, per layer. You simply wrap that LSTM cell in something called a compiled wrapper, which we recently released. And this basically performs the, um, builds the JIT compilation for you um, per layer. Alternatively, if you want to be a little bit more aggressive and try to fuse uh, across all layers, you basically move the compilation outside of the multi-RNN cell. Okay? Um, so pretty easy to use and flexible. Um, when is this a good idea? So when should you, when should you use XLA? Um, you saw some slides about that in previous talks. Um, I also um, ran a couple of benchmarks myself, um, training a multi-RNN cell with three separately fused, separately fused LSTM layers uh, running for 50 time steps. And I try, I try this on slightly different architectures of so different um, architecture sizes. So what are the takeaways? First of all, um, if you're doing this on a GPU, say uh, I had a Tesla K40 available, um, and you're using a small batch size and a small um, depth for your cells, today it's kind of a toss-up of whether it's actually faster. Um, the XLA team is actively investigating this um, this area, uh, and hopefully the performance will, will be sped up for this regime. In more realistic training cases where you have a large batch size, um, 16, 32, and so on, uh, even with a small cell depth um, or with larger cell depths, as you increase these numbers, your performance on a GPU is going to improve. 15%, 30%, 45%. Um, and again, this is an area under active development, so it's going to continue to improve. Now, uh, with a CPU, there's currently not much benefit, so uh, don't use XLA there. Now, if you're um, looking into ahead of, or you're interested in ahead of time compilation for an embedded device, say a Android device or iOS device, um, today it's not faster to use XLA, but there are other benefits. Um, there's a reduction in memory usage by the model a reduction in the binary size. Um, and again, while I didn't benchmark um, these aspects of it, um, this is something worth doing um, as you're looking into building embedded um, the models. So my current recommendation, try XLA, um, benchmark your intended use case. Um, the benchmarks are actually open source. They're in a GitHub repo. Um, so you can look at them and use them to, to um, compare the run times and the memory usage yourself. OK. Um, moving on from XLA, we have some handwritten C++ kernels for the LSCM and GRU cells per time step. And these work on CPUs and on GPUs. They tend to be faster for smaller batch sizes um, and on mobile devices. Okay, um, So try them out. 
if you're interested in fully fused um, calculations, especially on mobile devices, the LSTM block fused cell um, is even faster um, for these cases. So um, look at that. Now, if you're working, you have NVIDIA GPUs, you're using QDNN, um, we have um, QDNN wrappers um, that allow you to speed up your training up to three times, um, which is awesome if you're, if you're working <laughs> with these devices. And it's fairly flexible, supports um, bi-directional RNNs, stacked RNNs for LSTM, GRU, and a couple of other architectures. Uh, and as of about a month ago, you can take the parameters um, that these, um, these layers use and during um, export time, convert them from the custom um, QDNN format to a canonical format so that you can then take these checkpoints and load them in a different graph that uses one of the other LSTM implementations. Uh, what that means is that you can train on GPU and then perform inference on a CPU or on a mobile device, which is pretty cool. All right, so we've talked about that. Um, let's look at the, this neat new API that uh, we're working on for dynamic decoding. And in fact, decoding tends to be the most complicated part um, of, of many sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. Um, and that's uh, partly because you have to attend to the encoder output, and partly because you have, um, you're emitting uh, an example at every time step, and then you're feeding that back in. And the decoder has to decide when to stop. Okay, so the goal, okay, so, so we have this library. Uh, it's a new object-oriented API. It's under active development. It's, um, we're, we hope to release um, a new neural machine translation tutorial um, which uses this library. And the code is already in TensorFlow GitHub master branch in the TF contrib seek to seek um, package. So the main goal of the decoder is to make a plug-and-play and, and batch-friendly um, decoding library that allows you to first pick a sampling method, um, pick the RNN architecture, um, then pick, um, if you want uh, to have a fancy decoding approach, say using a tension or an in-graph beam search, um, and then decode. So let's start by first picking a sampling method. So during decoding, um, when you're training, oftentimes you want to just use the ground truth as your inputs at every time step. So in this case, we have uh, a helper called a training helper. And you feed it this tensor decoder inputs and the sequence lengths, and that's all you need to do. However, um, you want to try um, something a little bit more fancy. Let's say you want to use scheduled sampling, another popular approach um, for training uh, decoders. So you use another helper. Um, in addition to the ground truth, um, decoder inputs, you can also say, well, uh, the RNN is going to emit uh, an output. I'll treat that as uh, logits. And uh, I'm going to sample from these and uh, get an, a sample ID. And I'll use that as a uh, lookup in an embedding table and feed that in as the next, as the next input. So here you have to provide the embeddings, um, as well as the probability with which you're going to choose whether you use ground truth or you're going to sample. Finally, at inference time, you don't have ground truth, um, but you do have your embeddings. And what you can do is you can read the outputs of the RNN, treat them as uh, logits, and um, take the argmax, uh, the highest probability output uh, in your vocabulary, and look that up in the embeddings and feed that as your next input. So you pick one of these. Then you pick your RNN architecture. And in this case, it's the same architecture as we had for the encoder. And then you build your decoder. So this is an object that combines the cell architecture and the helper object, the sampling approach, uh, and possibly also the, um, provides an initial state. Um, now, the simplest one doesn't do anything extra. Uh, however, um, this week and next week, we're actually working on um, releasing an attentional decoder where you provide an attention mechanism um, that describes how you, um, at every time step, uh, say in translation, you look at the output of the encoder um, and say, oh, maybe I should be attending to this part of the, of the input sentence, and that will help me to decide what word to emit next. So finally, 
You have your decoder, just decode, call dynamic decode on it. This will return to you um, the output, the dynamic decoder output, which is the tensor, and the final decoder state. So um, the outputs uh, for a simple decoder, there are two. One is the uh, tensor of the RNN outputs at every time step. And the second one is a tensor with the sample IDs. So if you chose a uh, sampling decoder, this will emit the actual categories, the actual words that were chosen at every time step. And in this case, for the final decoder state, because you have a stack of eight LSTMs, it's going to be a list of eight tuples um, containing the LSTM states. So to combine everything, um, essentially four lines of code, um, first you choose your uh, sampling method, then you choose your RNN architecture, you build your decoder, and then you decode. So we hope that this is something that will take a fairly complicated um, procedure and make it as simple and flexible as possible. All right, so to summarize, um, I talked about a flexible sequence input pipeline that allows you to scale up distributed training of sequence models. I've talked about the RNN API in TensorFlow. Uh, it has hundreds of users within Google and many, many users outside of Google as well. I've talked about dynamic calculations within TensorFlow and dynamic RNNs. Uh, these have a reduced memory footprint um, compared to the, the um, basic for loop approach. They allow you to cast your GPU activations to the CPU, um, reducing the, the memory usage. And they're essentially as fast as the equivalent for loop. I've also talked about um, how to improve the performance of your RNNs via fusion and some of the trade-offs that you make there. And finally, I've introduced a new uh, decoder library um, that we hope um, you'll all check out and, uh, and try. It's available on GitHub now. So uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.